During the Industrial Revolution, the United States grew extremely fast, almost too fast, and this paved the way for corrupt business practices to thrive. But with corrupt business came an opportunity for the commoners and the poor to start reform, known as the Progressive Era, which spanned from 1900 to 1920. The people who would dig up the truth and report on the truth were known as muckrakers. During 1890, many Americans read the book How the Other Half Lives. This book exposed many of the horrible living conditions that took place within the slums of New York City. The man who wrote this book was named Jacob Rees. Rees was an immigrant from Denmark who came to New York in 1870. Rees experienced the slums firsthand. Rees set out to learn English and then later became a crime reporter for the New York Tribune. Rees originally reported on crime within New York, but the more crime he witnessed, the more he saw of poverty and the unfortunate conditions of the poor. Rees became impassioned with exposing, exposing the poor conditions, and he believed that he could inspire others to help make a change, and she was correct. After Americans realized what horrible living conditions took place, new living places were built bigger with more light and fresh air, and safety was improved for all. During 1890, Reese wrote another book titled The Children of the Poor, and it focused on impoverished conditions of the children in New York City. This was the birth of the muckrakers, as they dug up the truth and the muck. Later, Theodore Roosevelt claimed that Reese and the others like him only saw the muck and the bad. Even still, the, mi the muckrakers were proud of their work, and they knew that they could improve America with their work. After How the Other Half Lives, Many authors became, to, became inspired to rake muck. They started to write about child labor, corrupt companies, and food processing. Americans read these articles and wanted change, and soon muckrakers became one of the most in influential forces in the Progressive Era. During 1885, a woman by the name of Elizabeth Cochran sent a letter to the editors of the Pittsburgh Dispatch. The letter was so well written that the editors could only believe that it was written by a man. Eventually, Cochran started to write her own articles under the alias of Nellie Bly. Bly told many stories in Pittsburgh, her first of which being about divorced women and the poor conditions and poverty they suffered, while still taking care of children. After this story, Bly decided to write about the conditions within a textile factory. To get the most accurate point of view within the textile factories, she decided to go in first hand and work there. Within the factory, Bly found a number of problems, among them being girls that were too young to work in to support their families. While working in these factories, the girls' eyesight worsened and, ironically, they could not even afford to pay for glasses. By the May of 1887, Bly moved to New York and visited all the newspapers in the city. However, she did not get hired because she was a woman. Bly ended up sneaking into the office of Joseph Pulitzer, who was an editor for the New York World and told, her, told him she wanted to go into a mes mental hospital to learn firsthand what mentally ill people experienced. Bly pretended to be insane in the September of 1887, and it worked to get her into the mental hospital. And inside the asylum were women who were illiterate, poor, and physically ill, and the hospital would not release them. Bly stand out, stayed on the island for seven days before representatives from the New York world would break her out. Her story made many people push for things to be done for the woman, and eventually an investigation happened on the hospital. Once again, muckrakers had made a difference. Lincoln Steffen, reporter, editor, and crucial to the success of the muckrakers. Even though Steffens was not the first muckraker, he is often remembered as the first muckraker, and he was undeniably one of the most important muckrakers of all time. In the October of 1902, McClure's magazine published Steffens' article, Tweed Days, in St. Louis, Missouri. This article focused on the corrupt leaders of St. Louis stealing money from citizens. Steffens also wrote The Shame of Minneapolis during the January of 1903, also focused on corruption. Politicians in Minneapolis were powerful and used their power to exploit citizens and steal from them. Steffens aimed to expose this, and before becoming an editor for McClure's, Steffens was an editor and reporter for the New York newspaper. Steffens tried to reform New York. He wanted powerful people to obey laws, as well as elected officials to be elected honestly, and for those officials to be honest themselves. During Steffens' time as an editor for McClure's, he became bored, so his boss told him to go out and find a story. 
Stephens recollected the corruption that took place in New York, so he set out to other cities that might have the same problem. He eventually went to St. Louis, Missouri, Minneapolis, and many other cities. Stephens' stories were so extremely popular, and eventually got collected into a book called The Shame of Cities. Other cities enjoyed his stories so much that they invited him to inspect their own government. The Shame of Cities did not make the government pass new laws, but it did anger voters. Many of them did not know that votes were being stolen, and many were shocked to know that politicians only hired their personal friends for jobs. Oftentimes, the, thing, the things muckrakers exposed did not immediately change law. However, oftentimes, muckrakers would change minds. Citizens would now want every vote counted, and they wanted jobs to go to the most qualified individual. This caused new, better, more honest leaders. Stephens caused muckraking to become famous. He inspired others to learn and read, and he readied the country for change. Later, muckrakers investigated and wrote about greedy corporations, race relations, child labor, pharmaceuticals, food processing, and many other topics. During 1890, a woman by the name of Ida M. Tarbell wrote an article on muckraking. During that same year, a magazine editor by the name of S.S. McClure read it. McClure really enjoyed the article, so he went to visit Tarbell in France. When he arrived, he asked for her to write for his new magazine, McClure's, which focused on muckraking. Tarbell accepted, and she and her assistant first worked on a story about Standard Oil Company. The story took two years to complete, but much information came out of those two years. She found that Standard Oil bribed and stole from its customers. Tarbell remained indifferent while telling her story. She allowed for her audience to take their own position. The first article about Standard Oil was published in McClure's in the November of 1902. It took 19 articles for Tarbell to tell the whole story. Standard Oil was owned by John D. Rockefeller and made up 97% of all oil in the nation. The company was unregulated by the government, so Rockefeller could do pretty much anything he wanted. A law called the Sherman Antitrust Act was made to slow big business from becoming too big. However, the act was not really being enforced, so it never really worked. Of course, the owners of these businesses didn't mind that it wasn't working, and didn't work to make others pay attention. As a result, businesses threatened each other, and Standard Oil had the audacity to ask the government not to put in any other laws. Luckily enough, the government didn't listen to Standard Oil, and listened to Tarbell's story. Eventually, the story influenced the government to enforce stricter laws. After Tarbell's story, and the government intervention, Standard Oil cr crumbled quite literally. Supreme Court forced Standard Oil to break down into smaller companies. During the Industrial Revolution, Americans in city had few choices as to what food they were buying, and more often than not, Americans did not know how the food was made, or where it came from. A man by the name of Upton Sinclair would inform his fellow Americans of the disgusting procedurals, procedures of food processing. Sinclair was a reporter for the newspaper Appeal to Reason, and the newspaper sent him to investigate Chicago stockyards that cattle went through to get to the slaughterhouse. Originally, Sinclair believed his story should be about the workers and the working conditions, however, Sinclair found reason to write about the meat as well as the workers. The meat production was not regulated in any way, including preparation and handling. These productions were using sick cows, waste, hair, bones, and spoiled meat in the production of beef. As for the workers, their conditions were worse than subpar. Some spent their days standing in pools of blood. Injuries were common, and some workers even died on the job. Sinclair spoke for those in the stockyard, many of which were immigrants, and the rich Americans didn't know of the things that went on within the stockyards until Sinclair wrote his book, The Jungle. More than anything, Americans were afraid after the jungle. Many Americans demanded the government's help. The government listened, passed the Pure Food and Drug Act, as well as the Meat Inspection Act in 1906. These forced food companies to be more transparent, and so Americans knew what they were eating. In the end, muckrakers played a massive role in the development of America during the Industrial Revolution. Hopefully, even today, modern muckrakers will help to improve America.